Hello, 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 my Baselight friends. After a little bit longer waiting period and during the summer, we're back with the Baselight training program. And today I'm covering a really interesting creative topic. I'm, ta I'm talking about black and white color grading, which is something that I really enjoy doing. Okay, I'll say let's dive directly into Baselight. Okay, in the first part, we have a look at how we can derive a black and white or monochrome image from a color image in Baselight. There are multiple ways of doing that. And one of the most obvious ones would be to choose one of the main grading operators like base grade, film grade, video grade, and just putting the saturation down to zero. So now we ended up with a monochrome image. So what is a monochrome image? A monochrome image is one that has um, the R, G, and B channels all at the same level. So basically for all values in the image, R, G, and B read the same value in that case. So there is no color information stored in the differences between the channels anymore. But putting the saturation down to zero gives us a black and white image, but not much control over the process of how we can derive a black and white pass from our RGB color source. So I will show you first my personal approach for that process. I baked it out into a BLG file, which I call black and white. I'm now just applying that BLG. And here we can see it is a black layer. So I also added that to the BLG so that it shows me clearly where in the stack that uh, process is applied. And before we go into the details of what's happening inside that strip, I want to first discuss the placement in the stack. So my recommendation is to perform the major grading upstream of that layer. So basically above in the stack. And so if we're adding shapes here to shape the contrast and, and the brightness of the image, etc., etc., And the main reason is just practical that if you're accidentally touching one of the track balls on the panel, it does not have a big negative effect here on that image if we're doing it upstream because we know that below that strip the image will be monochrome but on the other side if we're downstream of that layer and we're then touching accidentally one of the track balls we can see so suddenly we are introducing color back into the image which might not be desired or if we want to do that we want to do it in a consistent way across shots and not in a more like a random accidental way, I believe. So that is the main reasoning for the placement in the stack. So let's have a look at what's happening inside that strip. The first operator that I'm applying is a compressed gamut operation. Here I'm compressing all of the super saturated colors down to a P3 color gamut. The, the reasoning here is that I want to sanitize extreme values so that we're able to derive a nice and clean looking black and white pass from our image. Typically, supersaturated input values are technical mistakes from the cameras and we want to bring them all down to a more realistic color palette. But on most images, that operator here will have zero or no effect on the image. It's just to handle the extreme cases. We will discuss what hue shift can do in a moment. Let's first have a look at color crosstalk and shuffle. In the color crosstalk, I'm only working here with the green channel. So we can see that here we can set the input of R, G and B for the green output channel. So basically here I can mix the green output channel. And then in the next step in the shuffle node, I'm then routing the green input channel here to all three output channels. So basically what that shuffle operator here is doing is it's copying the signal from the green channel and it's pasting it into the red and also into the blue channel, which then gives us the monochrome image. So the actual process in that layer that produces the monochrome output is that shuffle operator here. So without the shuffle, the image will look colored in that case, 
super green because here in the color crosstalk I set the output for red and blue all to zero to not confuse myself to make it very clear. So these are the sliders that we want to touch in this layer. So what is happening is that in the color crosstalk we can define the mixing of red, green and blue and then in the shuffle we're then applying then that same mix to all the three output channels. Okay, so what can we do with that a red, green and blue mixing? So for example, we can here raise the contribution of the red channel, which then gives us a very different rendition for the black and white, or we can lower that to have uh, everything that is, has a high red contribution to be very dark. Or we can change that here for the uh, blue channel. I'm quickly jumping to the next shot. On that shot, we can have a closer look at that. So I'm first grabbing a scratch pad slot with the starting value of my strip. And now let's change the contributions here of red, green, and blue. So basically what the color crosstalk is doing is it's always normalizing these values to 1.0. So typically I'm never touching the green scale because it will always fill up the missing contributions with uh, green. So now, for example, we're doing 30% red, 20% blue. And so that means that the rest will be used from the 50% will be used from the green channel. If I'm putting the red here to 1.0 and blue to 0.2, so then these will be first normalized down so that these are one. And then so now here green has zero contribution, etc., etc. And so in very old black and white film emulsions, so the first black and white film emulsions, they were mostly sensitive to ultraviolet and blue light only. So in these emulsions, skin looked more blotchy and quite dark. And so if we want to recreate that very old black and white film stock, I would then raise here, for example, the, the contribution of the blue channel a lot and here and lower the contribution of the red channel. And so then we can get a, get a very rough skin, how you can see here also quite dark in comparison to our reference value. Or we can also produce a very soft, almost like glowy skin look in black and white. If you're raising the red contribution here also, we can see that the lips are now getting more shiny. So let's store that as number three. And so just by comparison of the two very extreme looks, you can see how different results we can achieve just with uh, this simple method. So it's a great way to achieve these orthochromatic black and white looks. Let's jump back to the first shot here because here we have more color variation in it. So my recommendation is to do the heavy lifting of the RGB mixing here with the color crosstalk. But maybe you want to have much more precise control over the brightness of certain colors. And this is what we can do with the hue value uh, vectors in hue shift. I'm going to extend the range here. So let's say we want to have very dark reds, for example. So here the tomatoes are uh, red, for example. Then I can go into the red vector and pull that all the way down. Or we can pull it all the way up. So if we want to have uh, things uh, that are red, very glowy. So this is very similar to controls that you see in apps that are focused on color manipulation for photography, for example. So then we can go in here, yeah, adjust the red or, or the yellows. And here it gives us a very nice control over these colors in brightness. But my recommendation is first try to do the heavy lifting here with the color crosstalk and then do the fine tuning here with the hue shift. So this explains what these first four operators are doing inside the layer. But if you're looking closely, you can notice that the fifth one, the video grade one, is not a the default operator in Baselight. So I put it there intentionally. So in the video grade, we're only using the gain operation. And with this gain operation here, we can tint our black and white monochrome image in a desired color. So now you might ask, wait a minute, we're doing a black and white project. You can't just add color to it, but uh, hear me out. What we're delivering in the end will always be a color master. So, so there's no technical format, at least that I know of, that is just a single channel deliverable. So all the 
typical file formats, QuickTime or H.264, H.265, IMF, you name it. These are all color formats. So we're always delivering a color master. And also we should think about if we want to recreate the black and white experience that people had in the past, then we should also take into account the white balance of that black and white that people saw in the past. For example, if they watched a black and white film print in a movie theater with an old projector, for example, even with a carbon arc projector, then, then the black and white would not have that D65-ish color that we're seeing here at the moment. Then they would see something that would be much more tinted warm, for example. But we could also say our black and white could be a little bit uh, bluish or whatever color. So in the end, we're always delivering a color master. It's our artistic decision to put black and white content inside that master. And therefore we can tint it in the artistically desired way. One way of doing that tinting is via the mastering white point. Here in the scene settings, we can go to format and color, then advanced. Then we need to manually set our mastering color space for a black and white project that is typically not so critical. I would now use here a PQ P3000 nits uh, mastering space. And now we can select our mastering white point manually. So currently we're seeing a D65 mastering white point, but if we wanted to emulate a more like an old black and white film print, I would go with a D55 mastering white point for example. So then it would look like that. Or if you want something that is uh, much colder in the neutral axis, then go with a D93 mastering white point. And D60 is a great compromise between D65 and D55 as it lies roughly in the middle between them. So this is something that you should think about. And if you want to go into even more creative details about the tinting of the black and white, then use that gain control here. So, so that gain here is then operating in scene referred. So the highlight bleaching of the DRT will then still bleach the content towards the mastering white point. That's why I would still always go with the mastering white point first into the direction you want to go and then do the finer tweaking here with the gain. If you want to have full control with the gain, over the image similar to the mastering white point, then you would need to convert first into the display color space in the stack uh, yeah, a color space operator and then apply the gain in display space. But then you're losing uh, some of the flexibility to output to multiple deliverables. That's why I'm recommending this method here as a general practice. Okay, so these are my thoughts about deriving a monochrome pass from color images, which I think Creatively, it's always an interesting process. I always enjoyed doing projects like that. And now let's have a look at some other aspects of black and white grading in Baselight. What I'm having here are some monochrome sources. So first, this is uh, an example shot from a red epic monochrome that I have here in the timeline and we can see I just put it in with flux manage the automatic input color space is decoding it in the correct way and all of our um, r3d parameters are working correctly so i can adjust here the iso for example uh, the, the color controls they don't make much sense so we can see they're not having any effect on the image because this is really a monochrome camera so there the bayer filter was removed or was not added to the sensor and the camera and also probably the optical low pass filter was removed which should give us much finer details so images like that have a really like a certain quality to them that image here is from an alexa 65 monochrome from ari and here we can see as well baselight is decoding the files correctly in the automatic input mode and we we still have control over the iso value and again the the color controls they don't have any effect on the image because the camera only captured one channel 
with the image sensor. As I said, these kind of images, they have a certain quality. So if we examine the image at the full input resolution, we have a lot of fine details here because of the missing OLPF filter in the image. So it's great working with these kind of images, but you should be aware that you cannot do any kind of color keying, of course, with these input images. So there you need to isolate image areas then only via shapes or uh, paint strokes or luma keys in the image. The next example is a single channel EXR file. So what we can do is we can render EXR files from other applications just containing a single channel, not RGB. And this one looks not right as a start in Baselight and also we cannot set the input color space accordingly because Baselight assumes with single channel sources like EXRs or, uh, or also other image formats that, when, that it's now dealing with a matte because in most cases when we are dealing with single channel images, these are mats that we want to use to grade our RGB input sources, but not in this case. So something like this could happen in a workflow where you're maybe scanning black and white film for a restoration project. And then to save storage space after scanning, you're converting the uh, footage to single channel files and then loading that into base light. So here we have to use a small workaround to still color manage these sources because now they're just treated natively in the working color space. Basically, in that case, it's treating the file as T log. We can also see that reflected in the color space journey. Here we can see it assumes that the input is a mat and it says, okay, and uh, so it treats the mat in the working color space, which makes sense for mats, but not in that case because this is a linear EXR. So how do we work around that? So we need to insert a color space operator. We can insert it as a additional layer here in the stack, but you can also do it directly inside layer zero. I'm just overwriting the EXR exposure operator, which you typically don't need. So here I'm going to color space and then I'm not saying convert color space, but identify color space. Identify is like a retagging of the image with a different color space. So now I can choose just any scene referred linear input color space and suddenly we can see now the image is looking correct. So which scene referred linear color space I choose doesn't really matter because the linear tone curve is all the same for them and we're not dealing with any color information which would, which would have an effect here for the primaries. So typically I just use the first one ACES linear AP0. So now this image looks correct again. So, so that's the strategy when you're dealing with monochromatic sources that Baselight assumes as mats. Then add a color space operator, set it to identify and retag the footage accordingly. I have to say, while Baselight can work with and read monochromatic sources, we cannot render single channel output files. So when you render from Baselight, we are always rendering uh, an RGB output image. And the last thing I want to show is a small technical warning. So here I'm having a black and white ramp and I'm converting this ramp with a 3D lookup table from T log to 2.6 gamma X prime, Y prime, Z prime. So basically I'm using a LUT to convert a log image for a DCP. But if that LUT does not have enough lattice points, for example, that one here is a very small one with only 16 points on each side of the cube and I'm also not using tetrahedral interpolation here, then we can see some color bands on a, on a gray ramp. So I hope you can see that also through the compression that there are some colored stripes here. So if I show uh, a clean conversion, so this one has a little bit different white point, but here we can see or hopefully we should see that. Let's open the chromaticity view. And this one here looks very clean. If I zoom in so we can see, so now the conversion is done via a shader or I mean, to be fair, we should also maybe convert to X, Y, Z. But now we can see it's still, it's, it's a clean conversion, but it can be hard to produce a lookup table. 
that has the lattice points exactly on the neutral axis. So now you can see here using a like a, low, a more low quality LUT that effect is a little bit amplified, but also you have the same problem with other LUTs. So the message here is try to avoid LUT based conversions, especially to XYZ for black and white content. And in Baselight, we're not using LUTs for that. We're always using shaders, which give a uh, high quality output. But I know that in some pipelines, people are maybe rendering P3 in black and white and then using a LUT based conversion to XYZ uh, for the DCP. And then you can end up with weird looking colored parts in the images. And another thing that I noticed also in the past is that some uh, codecs also can produce under certain circumstances colored artifacts in black and white or monochromatic masters. Then you should maybe raise the bitrate or try a different uh, encoder, etc. Okay, so these are my thoughts on black and white so far. Yeah, there was one question about my uh, black and white stack. So, um, so I will share that as a link, but our download links are typically only valid for 30 days. So if the link is not valid for the BLG anymore, then just contact me in whatever way you find. And then I can, I'm happy to share the BLG uh, also with you with my color to black and white uh, layer in it. Okay. Thanks for staying with me today and see you next time. Bye bye.